head pulpit will preach. <laughs> Amen. Oh, man, it's great to see all of you tonight. Thank you so much for being here. It's a great day, isn't it? And I want to echo what Pastor Jeff said. I really enjoyed uh, the service and the sermon this morning. In fact, I've enjoyed all the young guys. They've just done a wonderful job. They really have. <laughs> Pastor Austin, Pastor Zach, Pastor Luke, I want to thank them. Uh, I think they're doing a, just doing great. But do you mind if, uh, if I just say thank the Lord also for the, the seasoned veterans? I'm, I'm not talking about who ser- those who served in the military. Uh, I'm talking about the, the wrinkle wearers, the gray beards, us with age spots and creaking joints and frayed edges and battle scars. Thank God for Weaver. <laughs> and Hawkins and Walter and Huffman. Yeah. See, the the old need the young, and the young need the old. And it's just been a beautiful blending. And it's been really fun and enjoyable to see the young guys come here and uh, jump in. And you can see them growing almost week by week each time they minister to us. I'm really proud of them. So, Pastor, you're to be commended for your selection process there. Well, speaking of youth, I was one one time. I, in fact, I was 22 years old, pastoring my first church in Fort Madison, Iowa. And a lady came one Sunday morning with a number of children, and she visited us that Sunday, so protocol demanded that I would go and visit her and visit her and her family. Now, I was 22, so that, that, was, a, that was a while ago. Let's see, 22 from 42. That would be 20 years ago. But 22 from 70, that's 48 years ago. 48 years ago, and I still remember that visit with that lady. As we talked, she asked me a rather unexpected question. She said, young preacher, are you into the deep things of God? And it wasn't just what she asked me, it was how she asked me. Because when she asked me, her eyes got really big, as big as mama's biscuits. And I, 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 I could hear the music in the background to the twilight zone. <laughs> now, I, I'd been a Christian less than five years and, and in the ministry less than five months, but, but I knew weird, and this, this was weird. And I I just said, ma'am, if you'll come to our church, you'll hear me preach about Jesus and what the Apostle Paul called the unsearchable riches of Christ. Well, she never came back. I had a feeling she wouldn't. And I was thinking about that encounter. And if someone would ask me that same question, question today, almost 50 years later, I would give them the same answer. Tonight and for the next three Sunday nights, it's going to be my great joy to preach about Jesus. John chapter 1, if you would please, and some of you have asked, how are you going to encompass the entirety of John's gospel in three weeks. Well, I'm not going to. These three messages are all found in John chapter 1. So John chapter 1 gets us started, and it will help us through our mission to completion. John chapter 1 in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God... And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. And down to verse 14, the Word 
became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. I came to the Lord Jesus when I was 17 years of age, the summer, in fact, one month before my senior year of high school. And I don't know how to explain that conversion experience other than I truly fell in love with the Lord Jesus. And I fell in love with His Word, and I fell in love with His church. Now, I still love the Lord Jesus, and I still love His Word. And most days, I still love His church. And since I love Jesus, and I love His Word, I love preaching about Jesus from His Word. I've taken my title for this three-part series from John's repeated phrase regarding Jesus. You'll find it in verse 14, and you'll find it again in verse 18. It's the phrase, the one and only. The King James says, the only begotten. It speaks of the uniqueness of Christ, how very special he is. So special, he's the one and the only one. Now, this series, as I have indicated, is based on the first chapter of John's gospel. And in this chapter, the Messiah is presented to us in three ways. First of all, as we have seen tonight, the Word of God. Then next Sunday night, we'll see Him presented to us as the Lamb of God. And in the third message, we'll see Christ presented to us as the Son of God. Well, when I saw that, I knew I had my three-part sermon series, and, and I knew you had a lot. All of us had a lot to think about. Jesus is presented in other ways in this first chapter of John's Gospel. He's presented as the light and the Messiah or the anointed one, rabbi and teacher. But tonight, let's consider John's declaration of Jesus as the Word, the Word of God. Now, I must warn you, our author here, John the Apostle, doesn't start gently. He doesn't ease in. He doesn't give you a warm-up or an adjustment period. No, sir, he comes out blazing, pedal to the metal, no user-friendly, seeker-sensitive, pole-driven, tolerance-based approach here. After all, this is John. He's a fisherman. He's the brother of James, and together they are called sons of thunder. What would you expect from someone called a son of thunder? There's nothing timid or apologetic about thunder. Thunder doesn't ask first. It just does its thing. You never have to wonder if thunder is around. You'll know it. Thunder booms. Thunder rattles the walls. And God uses this son of thunder to write this gospel account. Not like Matthew's, not like Mark's, not like Luke's. We call them the synoptic gospel beca gospels because they, they have a, a lot of similarity. But John, John is different. John is unique. John has a different way, a different personality. And the first thing that John does is to present us with a man who makes John look like a sissy. And that man is also John, John the Baptist, also known as Rambo. And we'll get to him in just a moment. So though the apostle is uh, a simple man, a fisherman. He takes us where science or history cannot take us. He goes back into eternity past, beyond man's present knowledge or 
man's possible knowledge. And he begins with the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. He tells us three things about the Word, the Word of God. He tells us, first of all, that the Word was before the world. The Word was before the world. Let's put that up, the first point of the outline here. Now, first of all, let's identify who is this Word. And the unmistakably clear indication is that, that this Word, of course, is none other than the Lord Jesus. He's identified in verse 17, Jesus Christ. Did you ever wonder why Jesus is called the Word? Because He is God's Word to the world. He is what God has to say. Everything God has to say to mankind. We may on occasion ask one another, hey, what's the good Word? Well, when we ask that of God, the answer is always Jesus. This word, this Jesus, was before the world. Before the earth, the moon, the sun, and stars, before the galaxies and constellations, before Genesis 1-1, before the beginning. That's exactly what we are told. Look again at those introductory verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So Jesus didn't begin His existence when He was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of a virgin. He always was. He came from another place to this place. He came from heaven to earth. He came from His heavenly Father to be born of His earthly mother. He came from up there to live down here. The Word who was eternally existent became flesh. He became one of us. In verse 15, John says it another way. He says, John testifies concerning him. He cries out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Now this is a shifting from John the Apostle to John the Baptist, and this is John the Baptist's message. Now this is pretty wild when you look at it. Look what he says. Don't miss what John is presenting to us. First of all, he says of Jesus that he comes after me. Okay, nothing supernatural about that. Jesus and John were cousins, and Jesus was born six months after John was. So John says he came after me. But then he says he has surpassed me. In other words, Jesus is greater than John. And John knows that. That's why he is compelled to say in verse 27, he is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He comes after me. He has surpassed me. But then he says the most amazing thing. <laughs> he says he was before me. Even though I was born first, He was before me. He was before John, before Abraham, before Adam, before Adams. Jesus Himself testified in that manner in John chapter 8 and verse 58. He said something that just well, it just blew the minds of his audience. He said, I tell you the truth. And by the way, 
that's the commodity he always deals in. It's the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And he said, I tell you the truth. Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. See, that was John's message. And John had it right. Now, Jesus had been in conversation with the Jews, and he had so, said so many things in this particular encounter that must have just made the Jews burn with anger. In this encounter with him, he said, if God were your father, you'd love me. And so the implication is inescapable. If God, if you don't love me, God's not your father. If God is your father, you would love me because you would recognize me as being one who was sent from him. He said, I came from God and now am here. He said to them, you belong to your father, the devil. He said, though you do not know the Father, I know him. I said, if I said I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. Hey, what a day he's got in front of him. And all of that fueled their anger. But it was when he said, before Abraham was, I am that the people became so incensed that they picked up stones to stone him. I preached sermons that, uh, that made people mad, but never that mad. I mean, I've gotten the stink face from some folks and, or the cold shoulder, but until now, up until now, I've escaped rocks and stones. Guess I have to try harder. And in John chapter 17 and verse 5, Jesus is praying on the eve of his crucifixion. And this is really the, the real Lord's Prayer, John chapter 17. It's the most extended prayer of Jesus recorded in the Gospels. And in that communion with God the Father, you know what he said in verse 5? He said, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. And again in that prayer in verse 24, The glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. The Word was before the world. Secondly, the Word created the world. I'm talking about Jesus now. He created the world. Look at verse 3. Through Him all things were made. In fact, without Him nothing was made that has been made. And in verse 10, He was in the world, and though the world was made through Him, the world did not recognize Him. In Genesis chapter 1, when the creation was being formed in fashion, Jesus was there calling it into existence. The author of Hebrews says, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. The Word created the world. And again, John's not alone in his assertion and a testimony to the beautiful harmony and congruity and agreement and unity of the Scriptures. Paul, the apostle, Paul says the same thing in Colossians chapter 1. He says, for by him, for by Christ, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things, he says, were created by him and for him. And he goes on and he says, He is before all things, and in him all things are held together so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Oh man, we get it wrong, don't we? We're so capable of getting it wrong. We're so consistent 
we humans. For centuries, men thought in terms of a geocentric universe that the earth was the center of all things. Then came, along came Galileo with a heliocentric view, the sun being the center of the universe. Of course, there have always been those who live in an egocentric world. They think, they think they're the center of the universe. Well, we now know that ours is but one solar system. Some astronomers believe there are at least 12 quadrillion solar systems, each with its own sun. A quadrillion is a one followed by 15 zeros. Geocentric, heliocentric, but Paul had it right. It is a Christocentric universe. All things were created by Him and for Him. And in Him all things are held together. If Jesus ever takes a day off, the universe implodes. And the more we learn about the grandeur of the creation, the more we learn of His glory and power and wisdom. The Word was before the world. The Word created the world. And thirdly, the Word came into the world. He was not only before the world, He not only created the world, thank God, He came into the world. He showed up. He stepped out of the mist and the mystery, and He became one of us. And He walked where we walked. John will say in his epistle, we heard him, we saw him, we touched him. He took that trip. He came all the way from heaven to earth. The Word became flesh, and he dwelt dwelt among us. He didn't stay away. He, He wouldn't stay away. He couldn't stay away. We needed him. And he came all the way from heaven to earth, all the way from everywhere to here, came all the way to flesh and form, the form of a man. He didn't come as a king. He didn't come as a prince. He came as a baby, born into poverty and oppression and surrounded by dirt and disease and disaster and death. You know, our world. Fully God, fully man. He came not due to an act of Congress because Congress would never have enough sense to vote him in. He came not as a result of a Democratic or Republican action. He came not because of a Roman edict. The only thing man had to do with his coming was man's need, man's lost condition, man's absolute hopelessness. The genesis of His coming was the heart of God. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He didn't stay away. Love required Him to come. And why did He come? Well, there was a lot of talk about that and a lot of confusion about that. In fact, confusion about who John the Baptist was and who Jesus was. You can see that confusion all through this first chapter of John's gospel. Some some folks thought John was the Messiah, but John was quick to tell them he was no Messiah. He was just the, the messenger boy. He was just the presenter. Jesus was the Christ. Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And wasting no time, Jesus went on record why he had been sent into this world. It doesn't take long, and you encounter it. You get out of John chapter 1, and you you see the uh, explosiveness of Jesus' dynamic personality with his first miracle in John chapter 2, and then you get to John chapter 3, and then the Lord does the apex of his teaching. He explains why he came. It was no accident 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, that only begotten son, his one and only, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, what do you do with a God like that? You bow before him. You wonder and you worship, you adore Him, and honor Him, and serve Him. You fall on your knees, and you make Him the Lord of your life. Let's pray. Father God, I thank You for this riveting, amazing, startling revelation that God entered into our realm. He came into our world. He moved into our neighborhood. He rubbed shoulders with flesh and blood as flesh and blood Himself. I pray that we will live our lives in awe and reverence in worship and allegiance to this Word of God. Who was before the world? Who created the world by His commands? And who came into the world to save it? May Jesus be the center of our universe. May we live a Christ-centered life. May we have the hope that only Christ can bring.